My name is Hannah and I am a young trustee and the director and founder of Hannah Benny Hood Studio. And I am here co-hosting with the fabulous Deep, who is a also a young trustee and the co-chair and also an architect, an associate architect, pardon me, at B First. Um, Welcome to tonight. I'm really excited for you to join our series, Life Outside of Architecture, Not Quite, which is a new six part series run by the Young Trustees, all about exploring disciplines outside the traditional route of architecture. So if you're looking for a fresh perspective because you're a bit stuck in an architectural vacuum, then you have come to the right place. So over the next few months, we're going to be hosting a collection of divergent voices from different disciplines covering the public sector, which we did last month, and you can find on YouTube, public art, which we're talking about tonight, development, curation, journalism, academia, and climate, and more. And we're going to explore um, all these different things and think about the experience that you guys have in architecture and how you could actually be the perfect match for a completely different job. Um, so today's uh, talk is all about public art, which is especially close to my heart because I am an artist. Um, but it took me many years <laughs> to be able to even say that sentence. So the reason why is when I grew up, I was sort of drilled by my very strict Arab father that I would be a professional when I grew up. And the idea of being an artist wasn't even on the table for me. I tried to even like wrangle maybe interior designer. He was like, absolutely not. You will be a professional. Um, so the thing I landed on that both of us seemed to agree on was architecture as it was like a sort of creative professional. So imagine my absolute delight and to sometimes my father's horror when I got to architecture school and realized that we kind of barely spoke about buildings at all. I feel like I had got into secret art school and I absolutely loved it and um, just had like an absolute blast. So fast forward to years and years later, and I am a qualified architect and I'm very much in practice and I am on the career train. And during this time, I missed how creative um, life was when I was in university. So I started making art and I did it on the side of um, working at practice. I actually did it very secretly. I didn't tell anyone. I worked under a different name. I kind of kept it all to myself because I felt like it was a really silly thing to kind of dream to want to be able to do. Um, and then actually one day what happened is that I was at work and I had gone for a promotion and I found out that I didn't get it. And oh, I was furious. I was not a happy bunny about that. And I just made me sort of really stop and take note and think about what I actually wanted and why I was working so hard for something that wasn't really truly what I wanted to do. And I realized that, you know, I was an architect and no one can ever take that away from me. And it's a pretty good plan B. So I decided to leave traditional practice um, and try and sort of chase this dream. Now, because I don't do anything by halves, um, not only did I leave practice, but I completely moved countries. And when I did that, I moved to uh, Vancouver. I gave myself one rule. And that rule was do not make friends with any architects. And I stuck to it. I didn't speak to any of them. And instead, what I did is I surrounded myself with artists and I really immersed myself in the art world. And it was like one of the best things that I did because I learned so much. Over the years, I've slowly released my architect's ban and become friends with architects again and actually realized that it's given me a really unique selling point to build my art practice from. So what I wanted to sort of create today was a mini version of what helped me transition from architecture to art. 
by creating a panel where we can talk to people from uh, the public art world. So I'm really excited to um, talk to these panelists here today. And they've got three really different perspectives. We're also breaking the rules a little bit. It's art month, we've got to break the rules. Not everyone on the panel has studied architecture, but trust me, just like my rule in Vancouver is sometimes it's good to speak to people who haven't studied architecture. So it's going to be um, fantastic. Um, so first, we are going to start with Shay, I think. Shay, shall we hand over to you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you got to doing what you're doing so fabulously? Yeah, sure. <laughs> hey, um, I'm Shay and I'm an artist and architectural designer. And um, yeah, also took me a while to say artist and like use that like role on my title for a while. And then I also say I'm a creative practitioner, usually when I'm doing educational work. Um, and at the moment, I'm currently working at Assemble Studios, which is a collective that is works across art, design and architecture. And I'm a part one architectural assistant, um, but because of the multidisciplinary kind of nature of their work, I work kind of the range of work kind of goes from like the traditional architecture drawings and plans to um, working on kind of experimental art projects, which can involve like research and development stages and like applying for Arts Council funding and looking at public programming, which is something that doesn't really happen with um, architects. That's usually not our kind of line of work. So yeah, it's a bit of a mixed bag really. Um, and also at the moment, uh, one of the projects that I'm working on is we're actually, me and two other people in the team are actually artists in residence. So not only are we the architects, but we're kind of also semi the clients Kind of, and that's quite an interesting role where we're able to basically um, create the brief for what the project will be. So we're looking into basically creating a social centre in East London, looking at supporting people and organisations fighting against land reform and housing rights. So looking at what that could be, looking at um, how we develop that is quite exciting. And usually the, we you, you don't get a say in the project and what you're supposed to deliver. But a bit about my like start. Um, so although I'm a part one architectural assistant, um, I graduated about six years ago um, from my undergrad. And I went to University of Nottingham and then I went into a commercial practice and quickly realized I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like the architecture world. Um, it was really commercial. I wanted it to be more community driven. I was like, this is not what I signed up for. And I wanted it to be more creative. So um, I decided um, similar to uh, Hannah, my experience is very similar. My mom was like, do architecture. It's the closest thing I was gonna get to art, like, you know, it was just, yeah, it was the closest thing I could get. So I just accepted that one. Um, but uh, I decided to, uh, I kind of explore different alternative routes basically within architecture. So the first thing I did whilst working is I started volunteering for a community land trust called Russ based in Lewisham. And that opened my eyes into just different ways of creating architecture, which are more community and co-design led. Um, and then I decided um, whilst I was working, I was gonna save up and travel um, and my main mission was that I was going to get some experience and do something abroad that would help me at least improve my, like, develop my career in a new way. So I looked at loads of different um, organisations and I was very sceptical and aware that some are better than others and also some actually exploit people in terms of their volunteering programmes and then actually don't really serve communities very well. Um, but I ended up uh, doing a three month uh, internship in Guatemala uh, for an organization called Long Way Home, which basically their like mission is kind of to like support and create um, environmental stewardship through their like school that they basically built. And they kind of built the whole school out of recycled materials and natural building techniques. Um, so yeah, they're a nonprofit. So whilst I was there, um, that whole experience kind of shaped kind of my practice in terms of my art practice today, um, kind of like was surprised and like inspired by how creative and how, um, how like 
involved the community was in the building and creation of that space. Um, so when I came back to the UK, I decided to try everything underneath the sun. Like I tried to be a set designer, uh, I tried to go freelance. I ended up working, doing loads of gallery assistant jobs for like the design museum, for the VNA, for Tate. Um, I was an art technician for an artist for a bit, which I found did lots of art jobs. Like I was on art jobs, website every day just applying for loads of jobs constantly um, and then eventually I also did a workshop for um, with a new direction who are a organization that promote uh, young people going into the creative industry so that's not just art but also like television media all different types of creative industry and through that I did a work um, a workshop which it like exposed me to different organizations and industries like block nine who are set um, um, design company do a lot of the big sets well two big sets at Glastonbury and I managed to start talking to different people and that was what really opened the door for me um, and then whilst I was doing that they also told me about this opportunity to be a production assistant at an uh, organization called Art Angel which until recently I was working for them only a month ago actually is when I left unfortunately but it was a great experience and I was like production what what is production? I don't really understand. And then I think it took me a year of working there to really understand what production was. Um, but they were like, trust me, do it. It's for this big project with Steve McQueen and it's going to be really good. So I was like, okay, fine, I'll apply. And I luckily got it. And so for the main, for whole year, I was working um, on the Steve McQueen year three project, looking at like orchestrating the whole billboard exhibition, which was 600 billboards across the whole of London. Um, working on the, with the PR team to like um, do the whole like exhibition opening and and it was very like a lot of the stuff with production which I've realized is similar to what architects do in terms of just the logistics of making things happen but it was without the design work so I was like okay I can do this this is fine but suddenly I was in like rooms with like senior members of Tate um, and you know like an Oscar winner Oscar winning director and I was a bit like over my head and like in disbelief. So um, moving to now, um, whilst I was also doing that, I was like, okay, I really wanted to my creative practice and um, the experience in Guatemala, I created this project where I wanted to create this installation, which I made called Plastic Pavilion. And it was about kind of creating an art, public art piece that would talk about the wasteful nature of single use plastic, but also looking at circular design and rege regenerative like circular economy um, and about seeing materials, especially like everyday plastic um, as a valuable, beautiful and accessible uh, material that we can use. Um, so I had the vision already, but I just didn't know where I was going to put it, what I was going to do, didn't know how to get funding for it, I didn't know where to start. And my friend had did an installation for a, a festival called Brainchild a year before. And she was like, apply, just apply and do, apply for that project. So I did. And that was one of the best experience I, and best decisions I made because um, having that support of like a festival who are a really lovely team, um, like supporting you along the way, doing everything from production to design to the install to deinstall um, was a great, like experience learning about risk assessments and everything and then from then I started like getting more exposure and the VNA saw the installation and I um, exhibited it at the London Zion Festival and it's gone to different galleries and hopefully we'll be exhibiting this year summer somewhere else so yeah that's kind of my general like intro a bit long but it's still an intro <laughs> Jay, I think I speak for the entire audience here when I say that's just absolutely incredible. And I think oh, thanks. <laughs> one thing that struck one thing that just strikes me is how how quickly you realize the world you stepped into in a commercial practice. You were like, uh-uh, this is not for me. And actually yeah. from that moment, uh, leaving what would normally be seen from uh, architecture students' world as, as a very safe route. And you know where you're gonna get to, and if you just follow it through and do what everybody does to go, uh, I'm just going to go and just throw myself at loads of different things, be it set design, freelance, producing, to really find my way in what I'd like to do. And I think like that that in itself is incredible. And I wonder like to, to people that are potentially further down the line or actually early stages in their career, what, what, what advice you'd give, um, what made you do that? And what made you feel confident enough? Actually, I don't need to know where I'm going, but I'd like to just test these things. And what advice you'd give to people thinking about that, but might be too, afraid to take that leap 
Yeah, um, I think there's definitely, uh, I don't know if anyone else feels like this in just here, but there's a feeling that like, if you don't do architecture after you graduate, you're kind of a failure. <laughs> I definitely felt that for a long time. Um, and a lot of my friends and people would say like, so what are you gonna do now where you've got an architecture degree? Like, and I was like, well, you've got a degree in something and you're not becoming an English teacher or like a professor in something. So why can't I change my like course? Um, I think the main uh, reason like the main drive is that I just didn't, it just didn't feel right for me. And usually I can't give my, I just don't have any enthusiasm to do anything if I don't care, <laughs> which is um, a blessing and curse, I guess, which means I can't do work that I don't like. Um, so I don't last very long somewhere uh, if I don't like it. And you'll probably, you'll probably know. But in terms of advice, what I've learned, especially working in the art world, is that a lot of people value, um, a lot of my friends who like say are set designers wish they did architecture. They see it as a foundation and a really strong foundation to start with an anchor that you can then explore other avenues um, with that knowledge. And there's a lot of transferable skills that people wish they had, which we learn in architecture school. Um, so like obviously the technical and the software stuff, but also the practicing of how you come to design and that process is something that is transferable in all the other like design fields, basically in art fields. Um, and also that, yeah, a lot of people would happily take an architecture student or um, who's done an architecture degree because you basically got, you're probably overqualified for quite a few roles, basically. So, you know, don't let that hear you trying to do something else because you'll probably actually get it. <laughs> That's so interesting to hear. And I, I, it's interesting to hear that we have similar paths to and through. Yeah. architecture. You got out sooner than me. <laughs> took me a few more years. <laughs> um, right, so next we're going to hand over to Leila, who I'm really excited to have on the panel because it's a bit of a different perspective. She is curator, producer, and advisor, and she's the founder and director of Art Square. Um, so Leila, are you there? Let's hear a little bit. Maybe Yay, that. I'm here. <laughs> Hi everyone. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, I'll be I'll be a bit short and really amazing actually to listen to you say. Um, my route hasn't been as exciting as yours, but um, yes, I'm a curator, I'm a producer and an art advisor. I come really from an institutional background because I was at the Tate for eight years. And prior to that, I was working at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tehran. So um, the foundation of my work has been very much the institutional background. And uh, while I was at the Tate, I was specializing mostly on acquisitions of modern and contemporary British art, but I was also contributing towards the acquisition of Middle Eastern and North African art. So I would say the majority of my work was towards acquisitions, but also I was contributing towards exhibitions that were mostly collection displays. And after about eight and a half years, I decided that it's just, it just became, the art world seemed a little bit small and the same names were sort of uh, over and over circulated, the same curators, the same people. And I really had this yearning of getting out and doing more fr freelance work also because I wanted to do more work with artists from the Middle East because I myself, I'm Iranian and I grew up in Germany. I am living with an American and I've been in England now for 20 years. So I was really interested more mostly in ideas of transnationalism, identity and diaspora, and sort of, you know, was looking forward to doing more independent projects. So that was really the main reason for leaving. And when I left, I decided to set up Art Square projects because I, uh, it just sort of seemed like the right time to also reach out to do some more corporate jobs because what I felt like in the museum, I mean, one of the ma main reasons for wanting to work in an institution was that I didn't want to be commercial. And I found that even being in a museum, somehow you can't detach, um, you know, you can't detach the commercial world from the, from the institutional world. They're so interdependent. Uh, so I thought, you know, it'd be really interesting to go to the other side of, of it and just go completely corporate. So I started advising a lot of developers in London and um, mostly starting with public art projects. Um, so they have something called the section 106. Um, that's something I got involved with a, with, a, with a few developers. And I sort of planned out their public art schemes, mostly commissioning sculptures. Um, so 
I did that combined with exhibition making because that's really at the core of my practice because the exhibitions that I do um, kind of give me time to research and learn more about artists, learn more about a subject that I'm interested in. So for example, last year I did um, the exhibition on contemporary running artists in LA that was combined with Freeze. But I also, um, I also curated an exhibition for my corporate client because they had just commissioned a sculpture, a bronze sculpture for their public art piece. And we thought it'd be really interesting to make an exhibition around figurative art uh, at the same time so that people really get an understanding of what we were thinking and really sort of, so that they don't just look at the final final piece, but they also get an idea of what kind of artists we're looking at before, what artists are practicing in, in London or further than London, and how they approach sculpture making in general. So yeah, exhibition making, I would say, is really at the heart of what I do. But I also advise clients on um, acquisitions uh, within their collection. So I have a number of collection collectors that um, you know, have private collections, and I had identify for them gaps within within their collection. So, like many people probably on the panel, I wear a different a lot of different hats. But I think at the core of my practice, uh, my work is very much about finding a way of representing an artist's work in the best possible way, and making sure that their message is communicated in 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 you know in the clearest way. So, I think that sort of the intro I have. Thanks, Leila. Um, I really like the, the, your descriptions about moving from a sort of institution to someone that's seemingly more uh, commercial, but I'm really interested in the conversation you, as you maybe have with those big commercial institutions and what, how they actually view art and, and, and do, they, do they see Section 106 contributions as a sort of a tick box exercise sometimes, or actually do they see, you know what, we've, We've got this allocation and actually what we need to do is think uh, rather than something that's placed there what what is it that the community wants and i guess that's where you come in and you yeah. you see the artists that are relevant and maybe people that these guys have not heard of so i'm interested in how you potentially mold that thinking so people think about art in a in a different way than let's put a piece here and we're done and you know yeah, actually, it's a really good question. So I think, first of all, even for me, it's been a really great exercise because when you're in the when you're in the visual art world, particularly, you're looking at a really different kind of uh, group of artists. And when you're thinking about public art, your um, your vision goes grows much wider. Um, before, I was looking at a very at a much smaller group of artists, and I think the reason is is that. It's so different having an exhibition in the public sphere to an, to an institution, because when people go to a gallery or they go to a museum, they are already psychologically set up to look at art. So you already have a willingness of people to be open, to understand, to take the moment, to question. They've actually put their time aside to think about it. So you can be a, li a lot more challenging um, with, the, with the artworks that you choose. I, not challenging, I don't mean that, but maybe more sort of controversial. You can sort of be not so obvious, not so direct, not so didactic. Whereas I feel like with the public realm, it's, it's different because really you have to be open um, to all sorts of different um, views. And, and more than often, you know, you're you're there while people are already, I mean, it's, you know, people might not be even aware that there might be a piece. So you want to make them aware of it. Um, and again, that actually, one of the things I'd love to discuss is like, what do we even think about the public sphere at this point where we are spending so much time in our homes and the idea of a plaza and the idea of a public sphere just doesn't have the same meet, meaning anymore because we just don't use it. Like in the olden days, you know, you go to a square and you meet your friends, you probably do less and less of that. But um, going to your question in terms of what my clients think, you know, I think what's really amazing is that really everybody is receptive. So everybody, whenever I come to the meetings, everybody's excited because that's the best part of their job. Um, and I think that's really exciting. It's sort of like, you know, everybody wants to be involved. Everybody wants to have an opinion and um, everybody's excited. Now the difficulty comes though, in terms of what do they consider as the right piece and what you know, do, where do we meet in terms of what I think is right and what they think is right for their branding 
and you know, with their MDs and their directors. So that, that is the difficulty. So I would say it's an ongoing conversation and it's not always simple. And I think um, also what you have to keep in mind if you're working on the public asking is you, you really have to work with, um, with the context, with the client and kind of be receptive to that. So for me to come in completely subjective wouldn't actually make sense because it has to suit what their message is. And if that's contrasting, then that wouldn't work either. So there has to be a good relationship. It's really interesting to hear that difference between um, institutions and section 106. That's, yeah, that's approach. Um, so moving on, um, last but not least, very much so is our uh, Catherine who is an artist herself she also runs Produce UK and she runs an art thing called Skip Gallery which I'm sure she'll tell you all about and graphic rewilding she's a bit of a superwoman <laughs> stuff. so uh, yeah I'll hand it over to you Catherine. Oh thank you Hannah um yeah I'm Catherine Borowski um kind of as Leila said I'm I also wear several hats, so I'll just go through. I'm not going to tell my story chronologically. I'll just tell my story if I, you know, with my three different hats on. So hat number one is with my art partner, Lee Baker. We're part of um, an artist, artist duo called Baker and Borowski. We run Skip Gallery. And Skip Gallery is an itinerant art space that's dedicated to taking art outside of the gallery into the public realm. So that really can be anywhere that you can park up and when I say skip, just to clarify, I mean dumpster, I mean trash can, I mean rubbish bin. So anywhere that you can kind of park up a truck, get a giant dumpster off and plonk it on the street, whether it's a street corner, a car park, a housing estate, a department store or a warehouse, anywhere we open it up as an art gallery. Um, in a way, the word gallery is a bit misleading because really it's a collaborative artwork. The skip, the vessel is as much about, is as much as the art as the um, uh, kind of work that goes inside it. Um, and our idea, we started, I think three years ago, probably almost to the day. Um, our idea is to offer opportunities for artistic interventions for artists so they could be emerging artists right through to kind of um, mid-career we'd love some really kind of like some end career artists as well but we, we 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 the idea is we want to create a democratic um platform for people and to give i suppose um yeah to take art outside the gallery so that people who wouldn't normally either have the guts or balls or inclination to walk into a gallery can also experience conceptual art or um, not necessarily just collect, uh, conceptual art, but installation or art um, that's kind of got a really high production values to it, but is, you know, is in a rubbish bin. Um, so yeah, we started, the first Skip Gallery installation was actually a funeral to my mum in Hoxton Square. Um, and uh, we, we kind of, we started Skip Gallery because in a nutshell, we were thinking, oh my God, Freeze Art Fair takes place once a year in October and the whole of the art world descends on London for a weekend or for one night. But unless you're highly connected um, or represented by a big gallery, there is no in for emerging artists, whether it's whether they're young emerging artists or older emerging artists, there's just no, there's just no way into this kind of elite art world. So I thought, well, I want a bloody bit of that. It's really just felt really unfair kind of being a Londoner, sort of stepping a toe into freeze, but knowing that I'm not part of that gang, I'm not part of that club. So I thought I really want to take my, my work to freeze. So I started looking at pop-up retail spaces close to freeze, which is in Regent's Park. And everything was either fully booked or really prohibitively expensive that by the end, you, if you, by the end of the time you've paid your hire fee, you can't afford production, let alone a, a kind of glass of wine for your guests. So I thought, what would be really good? Okay, a, a skip. We just drive up, get this, unload the skip, install it in front of freeze, 
open it as a gallery and before the council or the police come along we can you know shut the doors and move on you know so this was I kind of really quite like that sort of exciting gorilla feel to it um I quite like that kind of confusing people you know is it a rubbish bin is, is it art you know I quite like that sort of you know you know that sort of like arts a load of old rubbish type conversation that felt that really resonated um so yeah we did our first um our first installation in March 2017. After that, we'd kind of committed to doing a whole year of shows, Lee and I had, but then we just thought, actually, we don't know any artists. We didn't know who else we could ask. So we were like, oh, bloody hell, we've kind of started telling press, like selling in this story that we've got, you know, we're doing 10 shows this year in a skip and it was kind of really building its own momentum. And we're like, what are we gonna do? We don't know anyone. So uh, Lee just happened to, um, be introduced to David Trigley, who lived around the corner from him. So he wrote a handwritten letter and posted it in his front door saying, I've got a gallery in a skip. Would you be up for showing inside the skip? And he was like, yeah. So that really kind of knocked us off our feet, really. We were like, wow, David Trigley is, you know, he's a massive deal. And um, yeah, he created our second uh, show for us called uh, Look at This. And it was a bronze artwork that we installed again in Hoxton Square because Harringay, uh, sorry, Hackney Council, they kind of got us. And so we, we felt, OK, this is a really good corner for us. We've, you know, we've, we've they understand what we're trying to create. So we um, we had our we had one of his extremely valuable bronze pieces in there for three weeks and then kind of continued from that on. I think that artists would come to the private views and they loved the idea that it was experimental it could be performative it could be you know because we're not a commercial gallery there is no sort of like pressure on selling it is you know it is a rubbish bin you can't you know it's kind of in a way quite hard to judge that so I think that a lot of artists really enjoy the sort of art school nature of it it feels really playful um so after that we worked with Gavin Turk Richard Woods who you all probably know who kind of straddles the world between architecture art and design um so we went down to Folkestone to have a look at his uh his colorful houses and we were having lunch overlooking the harbor looking at one of his houses floating in the sea and we were like oh my God, Richard Wood would be amazing. So we said, we sort of dared each other to um, send him a message on Instagram. We didn't know him saying, you know, we've got a gallery and a skip. We'd really love to work with you. And he sent a message straight back saying, yeah, brilliant, let's, let's do it. So uh, we went down there to his studio for a meeting with him. And um, he said, actually, I've got an idea for what I'd like to do. And it was really funny because kind of he produced this drawing, Lee produced the same drawing. And that was to take one of his, his colorful houses and dump it in the skip. Um, so that's what we did at Hoxton Square again. And that was very funny because I kept getting phone calls from Hackney Environmental Health saying, you, you got a skip in Hackney Cat in Hoxton Square? Yeah, I have. You've overloaded your skip, you've dumped a giant pink Wendy house in the skip and they're never going to take it away. So having lots and lots of funny conversations with environmental health who um, were initially really kind of, you know, angry with me that I'd kind of overfilled my skip. And then I explained that actually it's art. They were just became very, very precious and very protective over the artwork. And it kind of almost felt like, OK, we're going to help each other here. And so um, they started looking out for us as well. When people started fly tipping, we'd have to go down there and stick our rubber gloves on and clear the art away. Um, and then from there, we got a commission to go into Selfridges. So the idea initially was to site a skip outside their new Duke Street entrance, but uh, Westminster Council, as you, some of you probably experienced, are notoriously hard to work with. So we were lucky enough to be able to install the skip on the ground floor in between Gucci and Balenciaga and work with um, Paul Kindersley and Sarah Ma and, uh, Maya Georgievich to create quite performative pieces. Um, so that's my Skip Gallery hat. Skip Gallery continues. I think we've done about 15 different shows um, and it, it kind of has got a bit of a world. It's got its own sort of fan base, really, Skip has. I think there's something about Skip that re resonates with everyone because you've either been in a skip, nicked something from a skip, thrown something in a skip, booked a skip, you know, it kind of, in a way it sort of cuts through class, which really, um, 
you know, that really sort of speaks to me as well, that, that everyone has got some sort of experience um, with this kind of funny old dumpster. So we get lots of people sending in work. You know, we've got a lot of kind of fangirls and fanboys who are, you know, quite obsessively send us photographs or little artwork they've made. Um, my other hat is I'm the founder and artistic director of Produce UK, which is an event making and place making agency, which I founded so many years ago that I, I'm not going to reveal when. But um, what we do there is artistic design and curation and production. So we work with clients from, oh, from King's Cross and Canary Wharf, through to Wembley Park, Cartoon Network and Beano, they're some of our, our real favourite ones. And examples of our work, we're currently designing and uh, building a crazy golf course for Cold Drops Yard, which will be installed next week, called Club, Club Golf, which Lee and I are designing. And that's a rave inspired, because obviously uh, Cold Drops Yard used to be the heart of the rave scene in London. So it's a rave inspired, crazy golf course. Um, and that's really interesting because we have to do everything from design, build and booking systems, website design, hiring staff, buying, um, buying staff uniforms. So that's as kind of turnkey and hands on as you can get. So it's really good fun, but it's also very full on. Um, we also work closely with Wembley Park and Quintain and have curated several of their Spanish Steps commissions. And so a few years ago, we uh, we um, answered an open call for a series of summer, they called it the Summer of Colour. Um, they wanted a series of artworks and interventions. So we were walking around there trying to get inspiration and we saw these this set of concrete steps. I think there was something like 108 of these really, really desolate steps leading up to Wembley Stadium. And uh, we just said, oh, let's, let's, let's do some work on those. So we started doing um, kind of vinyl fascias on the um, tread of the steps and working with artists. So we've worked with Mazer and Remy Ruff on those. And it's really interesting there because really that's kind of curation and placemaking because we've turn really turned something like the most boring set of concrete steps you could ever imagine. That's kind of really like a real wind tunnel that you'd probably run up and run down and try and kind of move through as fast as possible into this hangout where people genuinely go down there and they have their lunch, they meet their friends for coffee, they do their TikTok videos or their Instagramming, you know. So that's really, it's really nice to be able to see something really kind of from start to finish and kind of affect how people use a space. That's really exciting. Um, and then my third hat is I'm the co-founder, again with Lee from Baker and Borowski of graphic rewilding and graphic rewilding is we introduce the color and imagery of nature into the urban environment so that can take the form of a mural or digital or print and so we launched that I think probably about four months ago Lee was doing these beautiful um, flower paintings uh, for private commissions um, he was really inspired by uh, chrysanthemum by Japanese art and I was like, oh man, we've got to go big with these. You know, I, they've got to go on the side of a building. You know, it felt like a no brainer. So we just started applying to open um, open calls. And it, yeah, it's kind of gone, it's gone really well. We've just finished doing the interior of St. Luke's of meters and meters of hand painted murals and uh, bespoke wallpaper. And we're doing something at, um, Coventry train station for the city of culture. So the, I think it's a seven story brutalist car park and we're doing a temporary painting of graphic rewilding on there of flowers inspired by the, um, the countryside close to Coventry. So that's all my hats. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I haven't raced through too much. <laughs> oh, I thought that was a lo loads of hats and lots of things to absorb and I, and I really liked um, your earlier points about about being on the fringe of the fringe and and it was and and you sort of you know challenging the gatekeepers that are kind of the powers that be holding creating this sort of club and and then you kind of taking taking a jump um, and 
effectively challenging those gatekeepers and I, and I really like how you did that with the skip and and what well, challenging them but also the councils where you plonked plonk things on somewhere without getting the proper permissions for it and I think also that that challenge is really interesting I'm wondering how how you would um, what advice you'd give to people who I guess feel that they have been outed by the gatekeepers mm. in, in in the same way as you've you've used a tool which has become something amazing in and of itself but it was almost of a means to create the challenge to begin with but it ended up the vessel became a vessel for art but it was a vessel for disposal so a lot really interesting thing there but I'm interested in how you would Oh, thank you, Deep. I think that the challenge is good. I think for me, the best artists and art and artworks are kind of there at, at some point there is some friction. So I kind of respond really um, strongly to, you know, I call it a kind of F U sensibility. You know, the minute that the kind of the gate closes, the door closes. OK, I might be sort of temporarily stunned and kind of stopped in my tracks, but there is something deep within that takes over that. I'm just like, you know what, F you and I'm going to make it work. But also, I think that that's sort of, you know, coming, you know, my background uh, is I'm not posh. I come from a council estate in North London and I also kind of don't want that to be a barrier to, you know, to being an artist. I don't, you know, there is there is such a... Um, you know, especially now with kind of student fees and things like that, it, it's almost like the art world really is just open to, you know, the, the moneyed or, you know. And so I think that um, I am really into taking that challenge and kind of the beauty of being in London. So it's where I'm based. So, I'll, you know, actually the whole of the UK is that you really can do anything you want to do. And so I think, you know, really dream big whatever it is you want to do, just kind of make it happen, find a way of making it happen. And if you can't work out those steps to making it happen, network, ask questions, get on the phone and just, you know, the doors will unlock, lock. maybe it will be quite slowly at first, but if you sort of set yourself a goal, you'll come to a point where the doors will just fly open and the path will become quite clear so that's that's my thought is that we're really lucky enough to be in a in a kind of country where you can make anything happen really in terms of creativity that's so right Catherine I really agree with what you're saying there I, I can't remember someone said I think it was Scroobius Pitt, the poet, I remember him saying, um, the only difference between someone doing something and not doing it is the fact that they're doing it. And I always think about that as just like, just, just do it, Hannah. There's no excuse, no excuse. Um, so keep those questions coming in the chat. I've seen a couple pop up and Deep's going to head to, um, head to people. Um, but maybe first, I was just gonna head over to Shay and just ask maybe about what you think the some of the main challenges are to creating public art and sort of why you feel like it's worth overcoming them. Yeah, um, I think the yeah, one of the first challenge is funding and finding like opportunity to do it. Um, I think there is funding out there, but it's also just sometimes can be a long process. You don't know where to look and that can be quite difficult. Um, but in terms of public art and compared to like maybe, you know, commercial art, um, having to work in the public realm is just a challenge in itself. You're dealing with a, the context of that space. And depending on where you are, you have to you have to respond. You have to start a dialogue with the environment and that becomes a challenge. So it means that some things that you imagine can't happen. And I think if you come from architecture background, you would be familiar with it more than probably other artists because with architecture, you're constantly working within a context and you're always responding to something. So that's something quite in our nature to think about. So stuff like risk assessments, stuff like public liability, which is like, you know, if you need to get insurance, okay, someone like something happens to someone, if it falls on someone's head, like they become a lot more high risk than it would be in a gallery setting. And then there's also stuff like the weather. Um, I've once had like my art like turned down because it was going to be in Scotland and the wind was just too much for the, they were like, we're too scared. We're too scared. It yeah. probably won't, like it won't stay up. And that was completely understandable. Like there's a big risk in, you know, being in the public sphere and what that can 
do to the public, but also what the public can do to the artwork itself. Um, but then the positives and the reason why it's worth overcoming is because it's accessible and it means that you can reach people that you wouldn't be able to in a gallery setting and you create a different conversation um, than you would ever would in a gallery setting. Um, so yeah, and also if you're doing site specific work, there is just like, it is for that site. It is usually if it's community artwork projects, it is built by the community as well. And it is for that community, it's for that space, it's for both the social and the physical space that it is being buffed out. And there's a beautiful like story and narrative that cr you create, which just cannot be like recreated in any other context. And um, sorry, Dave, were you about to go? No, I was just going to fire in a question from Morris, but that was um, yeah, that was, that was really good. Go for it. Um, we've got Morris Wimby. I'm going to unmute you. Feel free to ask your question. Unmute. Sorry, hi guys. Um, so yeah, I'm a landscape architect student here at Greenwich in London, um, but like some of the stories that you guys have been saying I don't really want to kind of conform to the traditional path of um, a landscape architect after graduating are you going into an office and so is there any advice that you would have liked to give or have given to your younger self uh, while studying that can kind of keep the creative doors open and um, something like that yeah that's that's kind of my question um take that <laughs> i think um, don't oh yeah you go shay no, yeah, go first go i was gonna say don't limit yourself so you know i'd say the most important thing to do is obviously get on the ground work experience i think that has to be you know build your network as soon as you possibly can so if you're if you've got an internship even if it's for a week just just kind of make as many friends as you can be brilliant to people so that you kind of lodge in their in their minds but also kind of be um kind of be brave enough to sort of diversify slightly from what you're doing so if you're interested in art or music don't you know or anything else or reading kind of keep your other interests and hobbies going because for me or even if it's a, your day job maybe you work in mcdonald's whatever it is all for me all of this feeds directly into kind of narrative and um, the end result of, of what you'll do when you've finished. So I think kind of, you know, absorb as much culture as possible, but also absorb as much kind of real life and everydayness. Yeah, I totally agree with that. There's no, like just having a, maybe like purely academic um, approach to anything, uh, unless it's like infused with life experience, um, it doesn't feel as rich, does it? Um, so yeah. Um, Leila, I have a question for you. I was just wondering, like as a curator, how do artists get noticed by people who do do this sort of curation work? Yeah, so I think things, and we spoke about this earlier, I think things are changing all the time. The way I used to look at art 20 years ago, <laughs> am I that old now? Um, it's completely different to the way I look at it now. So now there are so many digital platforms um, and there are so, uh, there, there's, there, I feel like it's democratized the art world immensely actually. But I think in terms of who you look at and what you look at, I think I, w w what the most important thing is, is that, you know, you have some sort of, and, and that's, I hope I don't sound like a cliche, but you know, if you are an artist, you definitely have a voice. You've got something to say, and this might not be a social statement, it might not be a political statement, but but it might be a visual communication you have, but you've got something that you want everybody to see. And it's really important that you make that visible, visible in by all, you know, in any means that you can, whether that is through exhibitions, whether that's through online, you know, exhibitions, whether that is through sharing with different kinds of people, whether that's through a blog or whatever. I think you want to make sure that people hear you and see you as much as you can. And I think um, the most, I, I find usually what works really well is if people, if, if artists, that are very clear about 
why they're doing what they're doing and their statement is really clear, then there is usually a consistency throughout the practice and that makes it easier for me to follow the artist and to understand how they're growing. So I would say consistency and visibility is probably the number one things in terms of, um, you know, becoming, becoming, making yourself available for curators and other art practitioners. I think um, the other thing is, uh, you know, just get involved as, in, in as many exhibitions as you can, as many platforms as you can. As Catherine already said, widen your network as much as you can. And it's, yeah, and like everybody said before, just do it. Like, don't worry about, um, you know, making mistakes because mistakes makes you, make you more interesting. And those imperfections, it's like, as, as long as people can be part of their journey, they're interested. And I think it comes across more genuine rather than trying to present like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm the perfect artist. I've got it all figured out. That just doesn't work. So uh, from my point of view, those are the things that I'm interested in. Yeah, no one's going to stumble across your work if it's just in your bedroom. Like, have no, to... no, they don't. No. In the real world. Or you have to be like Jeremy Della and open your bedroom as, as an exhibition space. So I think you kind of, that sort of lateral thinking and really kind of like pushing yourself through your fears is mm. will kind of really stand you in good stead. I suppose it's a little bit terrifying, isn't it? Because a lot of things about art is quite vulnerable to do it. Yeah. To do that to put yourself out there even I found it even with the word saying yourself saying you're an artist it's like oh get you who do you think you yeah. are so yeah. like like even just saying that it takes guts well and you just open yeah exactly you just open yourself up to criticism immediately yeah. as soon as you call what you're doing art you're basically asking for criticism and opinions and that's something that you have to wear a lot of you know you just have to grow your skin quite thick because that's going to happen and in, in, inevitably that's going to make your work more interesting if people have something to say about it then that's a that's a very positive thing whether it's good or bad doesn't really matter yeah and also like that fear if you're worried about producing something in the public like putting it out to the public like collaborate as well just like going back to Morris and stuff like thinking about ways of um pursuing alternatives like collaborate with people on your course or like people you aspire to like work with and like you know do it collectively it doesn't have to be a single own like the artist you know you doesn't have to wear that title like all on your shoulders it can be a collaborative collective process mm -hmm. as well that's such a good point and I had a question, well, I guess to everybody, but it came from your intro where you talked about when you first sort of left the architecture world and, you know, flew to Canada and you kind of had this shady dual life for a while while you were building up your profile where you didn't want to open yourself. And Leila's saying that the importance of opening yourself so people can see you, but in that very formative, those formative years when you're discovering yourself, you kept, you kept that quite hidden, almost so that if there is any failures that people don't necessarily see that or is it more that you're discovering who you are and you're not ready yet to show the art world who yeah. you are yet? for me it was like a bit of both it was like I just I just didn't want to I didn't I didn't want I didn't mind other people's opinions but it wasn't like I wasn't ready for to to just say it in the office like in my studio practice and then I just did a very extreme thing of moving country to be able to <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 to do it because I could do it and no no one questioned it I literally turned up in Vancouver and introduced myself as an artist and that's all you have to do is just say you're an artist and then you are poof, you know just like just like that um I felt I had the same experience actually with kind of running produce I never told any of my clients about my artistic practice I totally hid it and kind of wearing my art hat, I was kind of felt ashamed that I had a day job and had a business. So I kind of felt for many, many years, I, I didn't do any art actually. I didn't do, I didn't make anything for about 12 years. And actually I'm not really a maker as um, my uh, friends will know. Um, so I think that that kind of having the guts to sort of, um, you know, be truthful you know to really speak your truth yeah I am an artist and I've got a day job and it can all work together and inform each other 
that's what started happening for me. One of the best bits of advice I got is that for ages, I, I felt too embarrassed to say I've, I'm an artist when someone asked me what I did because I didn't pay my bills making art. But then someone just said to me, they didn't ask you the question, how you pay your rent, Hannah. They asked you, what do you do? And it just switched it for me completely because then I was like, oh, okay. And then if it comes up and they say, oh, how, how is that paying? You'd be like, oh yeah, well, I do this on the side as well. But like, this is what I'm passionate about. And just like reframing things in your mind, how you speak about things, I found really helpful and it because it stopped me feeling like a fraud. It just made me change the way I spoke and you never know who you're talking to. So <laughs> constantly promote yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think that's that's a good point also because like a lot of artists and when, when I was like you know getting used to the term of an artist and I talked to a friend who um is an artist she'd be like I just create work and then if it manages to go somewhere then it goes somewhere and that idea um as coming from architecture background is that you respond to a brief you respond to something you just don't do architecture out mm -hmm. of the willingness like because there is a relationship in the context but with art there is a place where you can be like insular and just create and do your thing and then you can start birthing it out gradually and you know spread it around <laughs> yeah I love that and um, well we're kind of coming up to our time already it's kind of like zoomed by and um, maybe we could just quickly end up with some just top tips from each of you to like how how to get into public art would be great uh Shay do you want to kick off yeah, um, so I, I created this resource, which um, I think uh, we put on a Google Doc uh, for different like websites and that I found helpful whilst looking into like open calls, looking for artist residencies, looking for jobs in the creative industry outside of architecture and also like the the brainchild um open call that I submitted my first ever like piece to they're also doing one again this year so they're looking for designers young designers and architects and artists to submit something in the next month so I recommend doing that as well if you're interested in collaborating with people but also there's like tips for like art law which is something I'm still trying to get my head around like there's all this information how to like negotiate fees and how to do this and what to what laws you fall under there's loads of platforms online that already have this information and um so i hope that some of the resources can be helpful for people because they were for me um so yeah that's amazing and uh leila um okay top tips well um i think it really helps just i mean this sounds silly but like just have a really clear if if are we talking about particular just public art and just particularly public art i would say make yourself visible on i mean i look at instagram i look online i don't always see i mean with exhibitions i've usually done studio visits but with public art i very often just i'm navigating digitally so make sure you are active on Instagram, any kind of, you know, I don't know, clubhouse of people. I'm, I'm just getting into it now. I mean, this is sort of new things, but I think just just make um, what really helps is that a lot of artists these days, they, um, they make, th you know, 3D renderings or, you know, it's that whatever your visions are, just put them online. So it really ignites other people's imagination. Uh, and that's really the first step uh, to become visible and ignite imagination. So I would say that's the that's where I look at as a, as a curator. Um, yeah. <laughs> Catherine? Yeah, so for me, I think um, just start doing it. So if you're interested in working in the public realm, get your work outside. So whether it's that you make sculpture or you make paintings or whether you kind of draw okay, this is going to sound ridiculous, whether you're going to drape a tea towel over a garden fence, that is fine. Document it. Yeah, very skip gallery. Document it. And as Layla said, get it online, get it onto Instagram. That's definitely, I'd say, kind of a really key thing. And then when you've kind of started doing a few micro interventions, start inviting people, make it into a thing. So that's what we did. We started making it, we always have a big private view for our skip gallery shows. And all it is, we invite all our friends and our friends of friends to come and drink box wine out of a shopping trolley on a street corner. And before you know it, 
if it's good enough, if the work is good enough, and if you've got a good crowd and it's a, and it's fun, you'll start getting a bit of a name for yourself. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. That's so good. Yeah, I I, I would echo all of those things. Just get making, uh, get online, get connecting with people. I'm a big fan of sliding into people's DMs who I like. It's how I met Catherine. <laughs> I like to stalk people <laughs> until they're my friends. Um, so yeah, it's just, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this evening and got a lot from it. Thank you so much to our panelists for joining us this evening and for sharing their pearls of wisdom. Um, next week, next month, sorry, we've got our next, um, our next uh, series, which is all about academia. Um, and yeah, so we're really looking forward to sharing that. Our top tips are going to be on Instagram as well. There's in the Google, in the chat is the Google Doc that Shay was talking about. So yeah, and if you've got any other questions, do feel free to like email us at the or DM us the Young Trustees, and we'll I'm sure the panelists will help us out as well with getting some answers um, to you guys as well. So um i think that's it have we got anything else deep to share or is that that is that a wrap i just had a nice little nugget from her panifa that she just wrote that this reminds me of something that Kara walker said in a video there is no diploma in the world that can declare you as an artist you can declare yourself an artist and then figure out how to be an artist what a perfect end thank you Anifa. amazing thanks guys thanks, thanks all the outro